After two and a half weeks shooting this Z9 exclusively through Death Valley and Joshua Tree teaching workshops, I'm gonna give you four reasons why I think it's the best camera I've ever used, along with four things that still annoy me about it. And I'm also gonna give you a list of accessories that I've tested and used that I think can save you money and make your time with this camera more enjoyable. Well, hey everyone, Hudson here. I have had an absolute blast uh, shooting with the Z9 over the last two and a half weeks through Joshua Tree and Death Valley National Parks, teaching workshops to two awesome group of photographers. Um, and I've made some, some conclusions about it. You know, I was originally really put off by its size and weight. I would still like it to be smaller and lighter, but I have embraced the ability to use that vertical grip and the number of buttons and controls on this camera, and I'm awed by its image quality, usability, uh, a whole bunch of things about it. So we'll go through, I'll list some of the things I love about it, some of the things I wish they would change about it. Uh, and I'm also gonna go through a whole list of accessories that if you have this camera on order or thinking about ordering it, have it already. I got some stuff from L brackets to memory cards, battery systems, remote controls, carrying, uh, just some, some, some recommendations for all of you on things I think can make your life a little bit easier and more productive using this camera and save you money at the same time. So we'll go through all that stuff. If you're interested in just one thing or another, you can always jump in uh, and in the full video's description, there's a linked table of contents where you can just watch or rewatch the part of the video that you're the most interested in. And I'll have links to all of this stuff that I'm talking about. Those links help me out a lot, so I really appreciate your using them. You can always find out all the gear that I use and recommend at hudsonhenry.com slash ATS links. So before we jump in and talk about that, I wanna make sure everybody knows to sign up for the free office hours on April 12th. We're gonna be meeting at 10 a.m. Pacific. Big group free for all where we'll take your questions, give answers, it's gonna be on Zoom and YouTube Live. We can be interactive. Uh, and, and we'll also talk about some of the cool stuff that we encountered on these workshops. Rick will be with me. We'll have Woody and David. Um, we learned a ton on these workshops and we had some really fun adventures. So we can share a little tales from the road, plus take your questions. So make sure you submit a question when you sign up at hudsonhenry.com slash office hours. Okay, so let's dive in. You know, the first thing I wanna do, I, I've just got a little list of things that have truly impressed me now that I've fired a few thousand frames, shot some time lapses, panoramas, focus stacks, night scenes, Milky Way, action with the Z9. You know, I've shot a lot of action with it in Baja. I shot a lot of landscapes with it and starscapes and Joshua Tree and Death Valley this last couple of weeks. And I'll tell you, you know, the four things that make this camera better than any other that I've used are without a doubt it's stupendous autofocus tracking and the fact that the amazing eye and face detect that I've been used to with people with this camera now translates to birds and wildlife uh, and you've got a 3D tracking setup where you can move a small point around and grab whatever's of interest to you and it'll look for their face and eyes uh, and follow it around the frame. You've got hybrid modes like I talked about in my video on autofocusing this camera for action where you've got you know fast, quick, erratic, moving action you can grab with your wide area autofocus on the shutter and then switch to the 3D tracking and transfer that point you've selected really easily with the wide area to a 3D track that moves all over the frame with your back button. I have a video about that. I'll link that in this video's description. Again, just click the title to this video or show more. You'll see links to all the stuff plus the videos that I mentioned. Uh, so the autofocus tracking is Everything it's built to be, if you put it in auto subject detection, it will look for animal or for humans first, then animals, then vehicles, but you also have modes for humans, animals, and vehicles where it specifically ignores the other groups and looks for the one that you've trained it for. Pretty freaking awesome. The starlight view. Okay, I've heard some people saying, this looks really fuzzy. Is this how it's supposed to work? Well, wait till you use it in a Milky Way scene. I lit this camera up photographing this granite and a little juniper tree in Joshua Tree National Park in you know just Milky Way scene. And then as it moved into blue hour and even under Milky Way light, in the starlight view, I could see the shadow outline, the silhouette of the rock coming up into the sky and the tree coming into the sky. The sky is a blurry mess, but you actually see your foreground and you're able to compose and you're able to autofocus in almost complete darkness. You know, everybody else, 
in, in all the other brand shooters, all the older Nikon shooters, even the mirrorless shooters, you know, we're having to light up the foreground with the headlamp to focus. I didn't need to do that. It's insane in starlight view that you can compose Milky Way scenes and focus them. It's nuts. And it's focusing moves from where I used to say with the Z6 to Z7 to Z67, the low light autofocus works with planets. This works with bright stars. It's nuts working with this camera at night. Um, and I love its warm color view where it'll put everything in red, the menus, the images, the histograms, everything so that it doesn't blow your night vision. Looking through the menus, changing settings, reviewing images, everything's toned out red, just like your red headlamp that you use for the night stuff. It's amazing working in a group with its starlight view and warm colors. I have a whole video on setting it up for that in the C settings bank. I'll link that too. Um, the build quality of this camera. I was out one day in, in Death Valley, one early morning. We went in for blue hour, but there was this really high wind and it, we were excited because it was gonna blow all the tracks clean and it looked like there was a little break on the horizon in the clouds, but we went into a complete sandstorm. Uh, a whole group of us. We had some Sony A1s, we had a Nikon D850, we had a couple of Z9s, we had a bunch of Z62, Z72s. Everything survived, but I've just gotta say, I mean, I still have sand in my shoes. I still am finding sand in places in my camera bag and, and never once and pulling the battery compartment and opening the card slot and removing the lens later on. You know, I didn't switch lenses out there. Nobody switched lenses out there. There was just no sand got into this camera. It functioned flawlessly in a sandstorm that for those of you that are movie aficionados, just sort of think of uh, Fury Road, you know, <laughs> the Mad Max, the later Mad Max movie. It was a sandstorm to be remembered. And we got some spectacular images as a result of getting out into that area in that wind uh, at dawn and actually saw, shot some cool video of the, the sand just moving through. I mean, our tracks were erased as soon as we left them. It was a great morning. Uh, and finally, like I just said, the video quality with this. Shooting internal 10-bit video is just dead simple. No longer to shoot, you know, high dynamic range 10-bit video. Do I need to be bringing along an Atomos Ninja 5 to record externally through HDMI? This thing does it internally and soon it'll be doing, you know, ProRes 8K. It's a pretty incredible, I know a lot of people aren't interested in video, but this is one mean video camera. Uh, it does 4K 120 at 10 bit. This is pretty awesome. Finally, you know, this is competing with some of the other top video shooting cameras like the Panasonic GH5s and 6s and it really is a video camera to be proud of. I still have to test the audio inputs on it. I've been using external mics. Um, so I, I will be testing its preamps to see if it's any better than the 6272. I, I cross my fingers on that. Now, some things that really bug me about this camera. I'm gonna kind of leave my depth of field preview rant with Nikon and its mirrorless, the inability to zoom in to a depth of field preview smaller than f5.6. I've got a whole video about that. You probably know about it. I won't drone on about it. But I do think that's balanced a little bit by the ease with which this does automatic focus shift shooting. I love its focus shift shooting. So there's a little bonus other thing. You know, it'll do automatic focus stacking capture, which is pretty awesome. Then you just feed those into Helicon Focus and everything is sharp foreground to background. I'll do a video about that before long. Okay, so the biggest complaint I have about this camera is that they got rid of the exposure delay mode. And I know they took the shutter away, so they're not worried about shutter shake or mirror slap or any of that stuff, but you still wanna press the shutter button and it doesn't have a built-in remote control receiver. So you've gotta go into, I'm gonna talk about some remote controls for this and a way to save some money and get a better remote control than the ones that Nikon make. But you gotta get a remote control for this or use a 10 pin wired remote like the old days because you know, you're gonna induce shake when you hit the shutter button and bounce and you know if you use the timer mode the shortest duration is two seconds if you're shooting a multi-frame panorama or a multi-row panorama you know with 15 frames and maybe you're doing an hdr panorama every time you take a shot you gotta wait two seconds for it to click that's 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 nuts so and the other thing about it is shooting milky way and things like that the big green focus assist light comes on and blinks while you're waiting for the, for the timer shot to go, which blows everybody else in the group shot. So you can't use the timer mode shooting in a group for Milky Way work. So 
you know, the loss of that ability to just set it to 0.2 seconds, 0.5 seconds, one second, two seconds, three seconds, shut exposure delay where you hit the button, it does no blinking, no nothing, waits just a second and shoots. That was a great thing that Nikon had and I truly miss it and I don't know why it's gone. I think all the landscape and still life shooters and, and macro shooters out there spent half an hour of wasted life looking for where did they move exposure delay to in the menus only to find it just doesn't exist anymore. So if they could bring that back, uh, I would just love it. Um, number two, the fact that they have these dual banks. I did a whole video on banks. I'm gonna link that in this video's description um, on how to use them and how to back them up. But the fact that they put the settings for the shooting menu and the video recording menu into one bank and the custom settings into another bank and that none of the other menus are covered in those banks makes it really difficult. You know, let's say a bird is flying overhead and you have a custom setting bank for action and a shooting bank for action and you need to go into the I menu like I've shown you and flip to custom setting, or flip to shooting bank B and flip, and then you gotta go into the I menu and flip to custom setting bank B, and then you've got to turn the drive mode because for some reason drive mode isn't even included uh, in, in the custom set in the banks at all. So you have, still have to change your drive mode to high speed continuous. Well, by that time the bird is long gone. Unless you have all your everything set up expecting to encounter some action scene, it takes too long to flip through multiple banks. I just wish they had one extensive set of banks that covered all of the menus. And the other thing that's related to that is the fact that these banks, that the, the menu settings for all of the menus can be saved, but they're saved to the memory card. They're primarily saved to the memory card in slot one. If there is no memory card in slot one, it'll save to slot two. The minute you format that memory card, it erases all your saved settings. You know, this camera has such a huge buffer inside. I'm sure they could have saved a few kilobits so that you could save your settings internally and not risk losing them when you format your card. Um, now in that Banks video I talk about, I give you some alternatives. Maybe have a small old XQD card with your settings saved on it just for that purpose. Maybe you just save, you just load your saved settings before you format your card, format your card, then save your settings back to the card as soon as you formatted it. So it's a load settings to your default set point format the card, save settings. Maybe it's a combination of those things, but we shouldn't need to be going through those hoops and gymnastics on the flagship camera. It's kind of a, a vestige, I think, of the D4, D5, D6 generation cameras and how they worked, and I think they could rethink that. I would just love one set of banks that cover all of the menus, maybe give us eight potential banks that you could run through, and a save settings that saves to internal memory instead of the memory card. That would be awesome. All right. Um, let's see, the size and the weight of it, obviously, um, um, you know, I, I, it's awesome having the vertical grip. It's awesome that this camera is balanced so well with a long lens for action and sports, but it's also just an amazing low light and landscape camera and video camera. And it would be nice, you know, if, I don't know if they made it so that it was just a little bit smaller. Maybe there'll be future generations of this camera that are a wee bit smaller. So those are my main gripes. Um, you know, I'm getting used to the size and weight and I'm not about to go back to using my Z7 II. I'm gonna ditch my Z7 II. I'm gonna keep the Z6 II for low light work and for video work like I'm recording right now. I keep my Z50 for bouncing around on lightweight missions like ski mountaineering trips or just going to the park with my kids and this camera will be my workhorse of all workhorses. It really does everything well. It reminds me of how I felt when I first got the D850 and I felt like this is the one camera to rule them all. So there you go, those are, those are my, my rants and raves and it's mainly raves. This is an awesome, awesome camera. Bomb proof, does everything well. It's a little big, a little heavy, um, a little odd in the way that it saves settings and that you have to move around through the banks, but they do work and they are time savers. So check out that video I did on them. All right, so let's talk about a few accessories. And, and first I wanna talk about the battery. This thing has a battery that lasts forever. I don't know what the, the crazy SEPA ratings on this thing, not taking that many shots, but I've shot for days with this. Thousands of frames, you know, just nonstop and not had any problem with it running down. If it does start to run down, you can get one of these little anchor battery bricks. I've got links to all this stuff. 
This is like a $79 accessory. It's got 20,000 milliamps. The battery in this camera is only, let's have a look here, uh, 3,300 milliamps. So that's six of these batteries in this one battery bank. It's USB-C, power delivery. It's actually just a slightly more output than the charger that comes with this camera. So all you have to do is plug a USB-C cord that comes with this from this into the camera, orange light lights up. You can run the camera off the battery while it's charging the battery. You can stick it in your bag, plug it in, and have the battery charging while you're moving between locations. So far, the second battery that I ordered, which is inordinately expensive, it's several of these battery banks cost, hasn't arrived yet. Um, so it's actually more than three of these. So, you know, it, I think it shipped last week. It finally came off back order, but I don't feel the need to have more than one backup battery charged for this. And I haven't used the charger that came with the camera in the box. I've just been plugging it either directly into the wall through a USB-C port or plugging in this battery brick in my bag or hanging it on my tripod while I'm doing tripod work. All right, so that's battery, that's done. All right, let's talk about memory cards. So memory cards, if you wanna get the full speed and power of this camera, you need to have a fast memory card. And these, these Compact Flash Express cards are the way to go. They're much, much faster than XQD. They have dual lane USB speed. So the, the ProGrade 650 Cobalt is the best card I've used for it yet. I can get 70 to 80 frames at 20 frames a second, lossless RAW files. Um, which is pretty darn impressive. It's guaranteed not to fall below 1,400 megabytes per second write speed. Now, that's a big thing. A lot of these cards will advertise 1,700 or 1,780 or you know, these, these crazy, insane write speeds, but they don't all guarantee a sustained speed. Sometimes they'll drop down to 400 megabytes a second for long periods while it's, while it's writing. This card's guaranteed to stay at 1,400. It's expensive. This is a 650 gigabyte ProGrade Cobalt card. It's a great card. I find that I get, like I said, 70 to 80 frames, lossless raw at 20 frames a second. Now, if I drop to 15 frames a second, lossless raw, it never bottoms out. If you drop from lossless to the next quality compression level, it never bottoms out. So this card is really an amazing high speed action shooting card. It's expensive, like I said, it's about $730 for the 650 gigabyte card. This is a bargain card I bought to do video, but I've tested it too. This is Angel Bird. It doesn't feel as well built. It's 512 gigabytes. It's guaranteed not to drop below 1,000 megabytes a second. Not 1,400, but 1,000. And it's priced at B&H right now at a crazy deal for, let's see, 180 bucks. So, this card will write any kind of video that this camera is going to do. A thousand uh, megabytes a second is faster than any Sony camera can write to their CFX Express A cards. Um, so, you know, these B cards are the fastest thing out there. And I find that I get, what I, consistently, I get 57 images. So 57 as compared to, say, 72, 75, 80 images. It just depends on how much you need to capture images at 20 frames a second. Um, and I, I'm talking about the raw capture. I'm just completely ignoring the 30 frame per second or 120 frame per second JPEG capture. That's not something I use, I'm a raw shooter. So, and honestly, 20 frames a second is plenty for me. Um, so this card's a great deal as a backup, as a card to shoot video to, or even if you just don't need more than, than 57 frames at 20 frames a second, you know, this card's the way to go. I found that at 15 frames a second, this card doesn't bottom out either. It's just, you can shoot forever at 15 frames a second. So those are both great. When it comes to reading those cards, you're gonna need a, U, a, a Compact Flash Express B card reader. Um, the XQD reader that you might've had with your older Nikon camera is not gonna work. I've tested a bunch of them. I like the ProGrade reader, but I just got this Delkin devices one that has a nice little lid to keep it clean when it's in your bag. Um, card slides into it. It comes with two nice high-speed, super-speed USB 3 cables, um, and it transfers files very, very quickly, and its price is right. It's like $55, which to me is the best deal I've found yet. It's metal. It's got little rubber feet that keep it nicely mounted on your desk while you're using it. I think it's a total winner, so 
that Delkin reader and these two, you know, the Angel Fire and the ProGrade Cobalt, if you need the best, are my recommendations. All right, let's talk about getting this camera on your tripod. When it first came out and I got it, I had no ability to get it on the tripod. And I, my good friend um, from Luma Labs my, came over and we put this guy on it, which is a really nice titanium plate. Um, so let's just jump in here. Well, let me grab a, an uh, Allen wrench off of one of these other L brackets I'm about to talk about. So this plate weighs one ounce. It is ultra, ultra light. It's handmade here in Portland, which is kind of fun. And it feels, it's very low profile. It works great on the tripod. And yet when you hold it in your vertical grip, it just feels like it's hardly even there. It's rounded over on the edges. It weighs almost nothing. It's basically like not having anything on there, but being able to really quickly and easily jump right here onto your tripod and lock down rock solid. So, you know, a nice setup, but I didn't have an L bracket or a way to get vertical. And so I talked to Kirk Enterprise Solutions, my good friends there, and got a hold of this uh, universal L bracket, which actually I think fits better if you put it on sort of backwards of what you'd normally think of an L bracket. It's got a, a Kirk, a nice Kirk quick release, Arca quick release which if you drop it in here, you gotta kind of slide it in actually. I haven't used it for a little bit. Goes in there and locks down and you can put it on either side, but I thought it fit a little bit better. The opposite of what you'd normally be used to. Now to fire the camera, it's kind of odd because you reach down below, but it works just fine. And that's actually nice for the, the way that the screen tilts out on this. So it, it works well in conjunction with this titanium plate because it's as simple as having this in your bag and if you need to go vertical on the tripod you just slide it on you know now it's an additional gosh i got a scale right here i don't remember it's an additional um seven and a half ounces. So it winds up being eight and a half ounces if you put the titanium plate together with it. It's a fun option if you don't feel like buying a new L bracket every time you get a new camera and you don't need the precision of a custom crafted L bracket. But I will say it mounts nice and rock solid. You snug it up. That quick release on the bracket itself makes it easy to clamp to your titanium plate, which I like, love that titanium plate on the Z9. So that was the first thing that I had. Right before I took off on these workshops, Small Rig got me a uh, Small Rig L bracket to test, which is really nicely made. Now it doesn't use a, uh, uh, a hex wrench to mount. It uses a, um, well, let's weigh it really quick here. First of all, seven and a half ounces, eight and a half ounces for the, for the last kit. This is 5.3 ounces, significantly lighter. It's very light. It has two Allen keys to take the side off if you just want to have a bottom mount. And it's got its own little straight um, standard screwdriver tool that magnets right into it. And it has a plethora of um, threaded ports where you could thread something else into the into the L bracket itself, especially on the base. It's got one, two, three, four, quarter, 20 threads, a couple of larger threads, and then the little tool slides right in there and notches in. It's a really nice L bracket, and it feels good in the hand when you're holding the vertical grip. It's rounded over, it's low profile, lightweight again at 5.4 ounces. It's great, it's a good deal. It's an affordable L bracket. The only problem I have with it is it has a little bit of play. It doesn't come right up against the camera body, and it's a little bit flexible where it comes up the side vertically. And that becomes a little bit of an issue for me when I'm mounted on the tripod. So let's have a look thusly. So you see that? There's just a little play right there. And if you're working in high wind, you can feel it creates a little shake in the camera. If you're working at night, you can feel that give a little bit when you're shooting you know, a Milky Way scene, for example. It's not there on the horizontal. If you're mainly working horizontal, it works absolutely great. You know, it's nice and rock solid, but this just gives a little bit right there. So, 
you know, it's a great L bracket. If that isn't going to bother you, you know, for one thing, if you're not working in high winds and you've got a good remote control for this camera, you won't be pushing it and feeling that kind of vibration. See that? It just kind of creates a little vibration. So I felt that a bit out in the field in Death Valley, especially when we had the high winds. So I, I had one of the members of the workshop in Death Valley brought his really right stuff L bracket for me to check out. He'd just gotten it. And sadly, I don't know if they sent the wrong one or it just didn't fit the camera. So I didn't, you know, I, it might be that they accidentally sent him a D6 L bracket in a Z9 package or something, but it, it was a no-go. It did not work. Um, so stay tuned on that. But I just, after I got home, Jeff Kirk got me the Z9 L bracket from Kirk Enterprise Solutions, which I've been waiting for, and it's my favorite. And not unsurprisingly, people know I love the Kirk stuff. It locks in with a standard Allen wrench. It's got the tool locks right in underneath. It's got a QD port for my favorite strap system, the Luma Labs QD loop. It has a nice low profile. It's not quite as low profile feeling as say, just having this titanium plate, but it feels just as nice as the small rig does in my hand. Um, and it's got a solid built connection into the camera. It also, you can remove the side connection and just have the base plate if you want um, with the same tool that stores inside it, that same Allen key. And when you mount this guy on the tripod, vertical, it's, locked down solid. There's, there's no up or down give whatsoever. It doesn't, you know, that's just a little bit in the rail that I have on here. If I move the rail into the clamp, it's just rock solid. So it's not, uh, it's not bouncing around and you don't feel any play and it's not going to move in the wind. So Kirk wins my vote. Uh, on the L bracket for multiple reasons. I also, all, everything, battery, everything is accessible. Um, easy to get at the covers to pull off the HDMI, USB charging, which is so important without even moving it. It's a great L bracket. You know, speaking of Kirk stuff, uh, I want to talk really briefly. It's the one that's going to live on my camera about the foot. You know, if you're using this amazing Z9 camera, you probably should be using some great glass to go with this high megapixel sensor. Um, and the 100 to 400 S, the new lens, as well as this 70 to 200 2.8 S use the same foot mount. Uh, and Kirk makes an awesome foot for these lenses. It goes straight to a nice long adjustable Arca rail um, machined beautifully. And that rail also has a QD port for my favorite Luma Labs QD loop strap, which I think is just an awesome accessory you should consider. Um, and so you can just hang the lens with the camera attached to it off your side when you're working with one of these bigger lenses. Um, so that foot is a definite nice thing. You, you know, if you go ahead and want to mount it up, I like to keep my LRP3 nodal rail just to get balanced over my fluid head or my panorama head. You pull it out and the long lens foot slips right in. No need to reorient the clamp. So just a really nice system. Um, I love that foot. We've talked several times about this Luma Labs loop strap. You know, one thing I love about it when you got your camera on there, I'll try not to bash my mic around too much. Apologies if that made some horrible noise. But when you clamp your camera in on the QD, it's locked in there nice and tight, hangs down at your side. You can cinch it in for when you're gonna be hiking in rougher conditions or what have you, out in front of you, out behind you. And then when you want access to shoot, it's as simple as pulling that loop. And I keep this thing under my backpack straps. It's low enough profile, it doesn't really bother me having this nice, comfortable, kind of cushy, slightly stretchy pad on it. All made right here in Portland, just like that titanium plate, the full plate that we were using as just the seriously cool, just slate base plate for this camera. So I would definitely think that the QD loop strap should be in your future if you don't already have one. Links to all this stuff is in the video's full description. Um, now we talked about the fact that this camera not having uh, exposure delay, you need to get a good remote control. You can use an old 10 pin cable remote if you want. Um, I'm a big fan of using a wireless remote. And I'll say that uh, 
Nikon has done some confusing stuff of late. Um, for my D850 and D500, I had this old WR10 kit. It's a really little, lightweight, small, easy to lose remote controller that runs off of a large watch battery. Um, has a function button. And then it had a 10 pin port that you could remove or place this wireless receiver into. And the wireless receiver used the Nikon sort of proprietary port like the Z62, Z72, Z6, Z7 have. So the nice thing about this was I went from using it as a 10 pin remote to the Z6, Z7, plugging it in the side. Now the problem I have with it, first they quit making it. Now they only make a solid one that's it's hinged and it's 10 pin only, or if you buy it and a kit with the controller, it's $270. I'm gonna show you a cheaper alternative in a second, so don't tune out, that I think works better. Um, or you can gotta buy this piece on its own which is another 200 bucks. So if you wanna have both for your Z6-2 and your Z9, you'd have to blow 470 bucks to get the 10 pin hinged system and the separate Nikon port one and buy one of them as the $270 kit with the WR10 remote control. The other problem I have with it is the way that these mount in kind of diagonally in the Z9, it's too tight with the Nikon designed ones right up against the Arca rail, and it kind of interferes with getting on the tripod with this system. I mean, you can do it, you can clamp in low, but you can't get centered on your tripod because it comes up too close to the Arca rail, just the way that it goes in. You know, I'll, I'll show you what I'm talking about. If I go to mount it in an Arca clamp, let me rotate this guy a little bit. It just, it, it, it's really tight. I can't slide it where I really want to be to be centered without worrying about ripping that right out of the 10 pin port. You know, you can grab it with the camera slightly off center over here, but it really does get in the way, all right? And like I said, it's crazy expensive for a remote control. I really wish that they would just put a built-in receiver for a remote control like this in their higher end cameras like they do in their cheaper consumer cameras. Intervelo, which makes this nice little radio frequency remote control. Uh, I mean, I'm gonna link that in this description. It's $72.50 with this nice big transmitter with a sliding cover to keep you from accidentally pressing it in your pocket. Um, runs off a AAA battery, works great with rechargeable AAAs, which I love. I also use those with my headlamp. So my headlamp takes three, that one takes one. That's a four pack right there, which charges a four pack. And it sticks out enough, I'm gonna mount it in here. It screws in identically to the Nikon version. It's much easier to do before you put your L bracket on, but you can do it with either one. I wouldn't wanna do it on the tripod in the vertical position, but you can do it before you mount. And it sticks out enough and it's a little bit lower profile that you can mount it kind of however you want in the L bracket without it getting in the way. It slides forward and back all the way through. And that's huge to me. So cheaper and more efficient. <laughs> it works at great at long distance. It has four little dip switches that you can set individually so that if you're working with someone else with a Z9 with this transmitter, you can set the, the thing inside the battery compartment with dip switches and these dip switches to be a slightly different signal from each other. Can't do that with the Nikon ones. Um, the one thing I would recommend if you buy this cool Velo $72 transmitter receiver is to carry it in a little bit bigger bag. Same thing with the Nikon one. That way you don't lose it in your bag because they're both small. And put some little pieces of gaff tape. I've got pieces of gaff tape in here, sort of pre-ripped with a little bit of the edge folded over so I can get an easy hold of them on the inside of the bag or off of the device. And the reason for it is when you press this button, you'll notice it has a really bright blue LED light. And when you're working at night, that's not so great for all the people around you. So this way it hides that bright blue activation light. Um, and then some little smaller ones that you can just go ahead and mount over the blinking red LED here on the receiver. And that way you're blacked out for say Milky Way work. And this thing works great. You just, we're in high speed mode. It's pretty freaking awesome. Uh, I, I am a big fan and the fact that you can close it up to stick it in your pocket without accidentally firing is also really, really nice. So my vote is for the Velo system. Keep it in a big Ziploc in your bag. All right, so one last thing is filters. You know, you're gonna be using this really high-end sensor. You're gonna be using great new S-glass or the best of the F-glass through the FTZ adapter on a camera this nice. 
Thinking about filters and making sure that you're using really high-end filters, you know, the more I use these new case magnetic filters, the more I adore them. The more I use the 112 millimeter system, the more I love using it. Now I carry sometimes both the 82 and the 112, but the fact that the 112 system fits this HB97 hood that you can buy separately or it comes with the 14 to 24 2.8, and it snaps just like it does on the 14 to 24 into place on the 24 to 70 2.8, the, uh, the, the 70 to 200 2.8, the 51.2, the 14 to 30 F4 um, just makes it such a breeze to work with these really low profile, durable, high quality, color neutral filters. You know, this little case, even though they're 112 millimeters, doesn't weigh that much, isn't that thick, isn't that much room in my bag. And inside, I have UV, circular polarizer, 3, 6, 10 stop neutral density filters and neutral night filters. And using them is as easy as just pulling one carefully out and dropping it into the magnetic ring I have mounted in that HB97 hood, just like that. And if I want to use it on a 77 millimeter threaded lens, like, you know, say this new 24 to 120 F4 that I adore, the new S version, you slip this 77 to 112 magnetic adapter on there, and all you have to do is, you know, pull your magnetic filter and click it right onto that magnetic adapter ring bam, you're good to go. So no worry about vignetting, even when you're stacking as many filters as you want using these and you're future-proofed if you get a big lens. Let's say Zeiss makes some lens you really want down the road and it's 95 millimeters. Well, you can use it with your 112s and a 95 to 112 magnetic adapter ring. That 500 PF, if for some reason you want to polarize or shoot some crazy long distance, long exposure, you, you're set with the kit that you have just with a 95 to 112 adapter ring. So those are my must have sort of recommended accessories for the Z9. If you're interested in these case filters, I have more info. I promote and sell them myself. I adore them. Can't imagine going back to threaded filters or square fit filters. Um, so those are on my site at hudsonhenry.com slash case. All this gear that I'm talking about, click on the video's description or show more depending on your platform. You'll find it along with a chaptered out table of contents to watch or rewatch any part of this video. You can always find all the gear that I love, use and promote uh, and recommend at hudsonhenry.com slash ATS links. I keep that updated. Thanks to everyone for sharing, liking and subscribing to this channel. Thanks for all the emails that you send with suggestions. Your comments, questions and input really drive the content in this channel and I appreciate it more than I can tell you. Um, I want to make sure everyone knows, sign up for my office hours, April 12th, Rick and I, David, Woody, Darren, we're all going to be there. Uh, we'll be talking about some of the cool stuff that we learned on this latest trip to Death Valley. We had a quorum of Sony shooters and Nikon shooters. We had a bunch of A1s out there, some Z9s, some Z7Ts. We were in crazy conditions. We have beautiful light. We'll tell some stories from the road, some lessons learned, and we'll take your questions. So leave those questions when you sign up for Zoom or YouTube Live for this big free get together at hudsonhenry.com slash office hours. And we'll see you 10 a.m. Pacific on April 12th. So I hope that everybody is enjoying the beginning of spring here in the Northern Hemisphere, the beginning of fall down south. Uh, some, two of my favorite times to shoot. So wherever you are, it's a good time to be out there. I hope everyone's staying safe, staying creative. We'll see you next week.